Hi, I'm Andy from Adaptronic and this is a video of one of the talks I did at PRI in 2016. I did three talks, one of them was on fuel modelling, one on closed loop control and one on our new ECUs and new software. So this is the first talk of three which is on the fuel modelling. Thank you very much to Bradley Smith from Turning Point Technology in Queensland um, who helped me out with the videoing. This topic is actually quite theoretical so I'm um, sorry if it's a little bit boring. At a later stage I'll split this up into three separate normal Andy talking head videos and showing you how to set up everything in the software for the ECUs. But this talk is just about the theory and the physics of what actually happens inside the engine so it's applicable to any ECU. Thanks very much to all who attended and I hope it's of use to you. Okay well thank you very much everyone for coming. Um, my name's Andy Wyatt, I run Adaptronic, we make aftermarket engine control units. I've been selling them for about I don't know, 12 or something years by now. You know, you sort of lose count after a while. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to be talking about fuel modelling for port-injected engines. So um, how we get from, or how we work out what an engine wants, basically, in terms of fuel, or how an ECU works it out. Um, so just very quickly about me, I'm an engineer. I'm not a tuner. So um, I mean, I, I can tune. I, I have to, but I don't have the you know, 20 years of experience of developing mechanical sympathy that, um, that you guys have. Um, also, I'm an engineer, so I'm not a professional speaker. I'm not a Tony Robbins, you know, get up and high five your neighbor sort of person. Um, you can tell an extroverted engineer because he looks at the other person's shoes when he's talking, so that's sort of what I'm like. But I will be asking for some audience participation at some points where I've got some questions. I want you to call out some answers. Um, and for these, I've got these Tim Tam things, which I realize you don't have here, and I'll throw them out to people that answer. So there's a little incentive. Um, now, although I don't have a lot of tuning experience, I do have um, um, an engineering degree. I did, you know, got first class honours and all that sort of thing, and a computer science degree. So I've got a fair bit of the theory, and I do talk to a lot of tuners, and I get the impression that um, some of them could probably benefit from some of the theory, which is why I'm, I'm sharing this with you now. Um, so this is actually the first talk of three that I'm doing. Um, in this one, I'll be talking about fuel requirements of engines. Um, going through, I'm sure you've all seen Greg Banish's t-shirt, um, so I'll go through the derivation of that. Um, also transient conditions, um, and also how an ECU would get from a fuel quantity which needs to be delivered to an injector pulse duration in milliseconds, uh, which sounds simple but actually depends on a lot of things and um, yeah, you can make it better by taking those other things into account. I'm also doing a talk tomorrow on closed loop control, so PRD controllers at 2 p.m. in the same room here, and then I'll be doing another talk at 3 p.m. straight after that one on our new ECUs, walking through the software and all that sort of thing. Okay, so we've all seen the famous T-shirt. Um, I've got to make a bit of a confession here. I don't quite... I can interpret this one of two ways. One of them is that um, it's a really complicated formula with lots of terms in it, and if there's any one of them that you don't understand, then you're not going to understand the whole thing. Um, the other way of interpreting is that it's not that hard, it's simple, tuners should understand this. Why don't they understand it? Maybe it's one of those things that's supposed to be um, interpreted two ways, um, I'm not really sure. But in about 20 minutes we'll understand everything on that t-shirt. So, um, I'll go back to the basics and how things have been done historically. So the purpose of um, injection control in the ECU is to actually get the right amount of fuel into the engine to achieve a certain lambda value. Um, when the tune is not there to make a change. So that means that it's got to um, be generating the same lambda under all conditions that the engine's going to see, um, and that can often lead to various complications. So the way that, um, the way that it used to be done um, is that someone worked out that um, the injector millisecond that you need um, to deliver varies mostly with uh, manifold pressure, or load, you know, there are various ways of measuring it. Um, and to a lesser extent with RPM, the volumetric efficiency changes you know, with RPM when cams start to work and cams don't work and that sort of thing. Um, so the way that it used to be done is you'd have a millisecond based fuel map um, where you have milliseconds in the fuel map and then on one axis you've got RPM, on the other axis you've got manifold pressure, map, vacuum, load, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then the ECU just looks up the milliseconds that you need to deliver. And that works pretty well, um, so long as all the other variables are constant. So 
So this is Tim Tam time. Um, what other variables are we assuming are constant, which may not actually be constant in practice? Sorry? Who said temperature? <laughs> Sorry, Adam. <laughs> what did you say? Fuel pressure. Fuel pressure? Definitely. Barometric pressure. Who was barometric pressure? Oh, yep. Well, that was any others? Sorry? Humidity. You're also sending the mass for it as a it's representing the whole mantle. Yes. <laughs> okay, you get two of them. Who said voltage? Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Like I said, I'm an engineer, not a pro baseball player. Um, any others? Fuel chemistry. Sorry, fuel chemistry. Yep. Fuel temperature. Fuel temperature. Whoops. <laughs> any others? No. Okay. Well, that's basically all the ones that I thought of. Um. Oh no. Don't tell me the Bluetooth is. Oh, boo, that's sad. Okay, so um, I'm going to have to do that manually now. Um, so here are some of the things that I came up with, which are most of the things that you came up with as well. Um, one of the other things that I'm going to put in there as a bit of a, um, to sort of challenge your thinking a little bit, is injector type. Now you'd say, well, injector type's not really a variable. That's a constant. You put it in there when you tune it, you know, What's the problem? Um, but what I will say is that a lot of tuners I've found tend to specialize in, in certain sorts of engines. So um, I mean, many tuners tune whatever comes in the door. But if you specialize in a particular sort of engine, then you end up with a fairly good library of maps for that engine. And if you, um, you don't always get the choice, though, of what, what injectors are on the engine when it comes in to tune it, even though if you build it and you sell the injectors to the customer, you can, but you don't always get to choose what comes in. Um, so if every, um, if every tune that you're doing has got different injectors and you've got a millisecond based um, fuel map, then you can't, really, um, you can't really use one on another car very easily. You need to start from scratch each time. And of course, people do change injectors when they're doing builds. But that's not the biggest thing. Oh, yes, yeah, so, oh, well, sure, thank you. Okay, so for each of these variables, um, ECU manufacturers generally had the choice to either provide a a compensation or a correction table, which the tuner could then adjust, or to ignore the variable altogether. Now, fuel pressure is um, probably one of the biggest ones that, um, that's thought to be a constant, but um, when you actually start measuring it, you find it's not actually all that constant at all. Um, and these are actually, I actually discovered this when I was building a machine to test injectors um, to, for the last part of the talk, which I'll tell you about later. Um, and I had a a pressure reg with a gauge on it and I had a single ID725 injector on it. When I turned on the injector at full, you know, just gave it 12 volts, um, I saw the gauge move by, um, I think it was a couple of PSI or something. And I thought, well, that's not very good as a regulator. I mean, it's only one injector and it's only 725 cc's. Um, so then I started measuring different regulators to see how well they actually, um, how well they actually do regulate fuel pressure. Now, um, I've blacked out all the names here because I don't really want to you know, create welfare for lawyers. Um, but the, this blue one here is actually the flattest out of all of the curves that you see. And that's the um, TurboSmart FPR2000. This one here, you can see in this sort of start region here, it's actually a lot steeper than all the others. And then once you get above four litres per minute of fuel flow, it becomes really bad. What's also worse is that when it went up, and then came back down, there are different fuel pressures. So there's actually hysteresis in there as well. Um, that's actually the factory fuel pressure regulator, often a Mazda RX-7 FD. Um, and you say, well, how can it be so bad being an OEM device? And the answer is because the OEM device is designed to run at OEM power levels, and it doesn't need such a wide range of fuel flow. If you're only making you know, 250 horsepower at the wheels or something, you don't need something that can run you know, up to seven litres per minute. What's that in your units? 400 gallons an hour or whatever it is. 
Um, whereas if you're building a, you know, a, a big system with you know, eight 2,000 cc injectors, um, you're obviously going to need a much bigger regulator to do that. Um, yeah, could you go forward one more? If we actually just take the linear sections of all those graphs and look at the um, you know, plot regression lines through them and look at the slope of each one, you see this um, uh, factor out 7 one is actually four times the slope of the, um, the TurboSmart one. Um, and if you're not monitoring fuel pressure, you wouldn't actually know about this. Um, and people say, well, you know, you need higher numbers in a VE map at higher loads. In, in general, you actually don't when you actually um, correct for this properly, which I'll get to a bit later. But anyway, that's, a, that's an example of a constant, which is not actually a constant. Yep, thanks. Um, another one is battery voltage, uh, which we heard from up there, I think. Um, so people yeah, with these you know, very simple ECUs would say, well, it goes lean at idle when I turn the headlights on. And in fact, one um, ECU manufacturer, who I won't mention by name, I've heard some tuners say that, that you have to set them to idle rich because otherwise when you turn the headlights on, they'll stall. Um, and so what they did was they, well, they, you know, ECU manufacturers generally did was they would put in a, a battery voltage compensation table so you can add a certain amount of milliseconds, you know, depending on the battery voltage. Um, and that works to get around that. Um, how does a, a tuner actually know what to put in that table? Um, they're not going to disconnect the alternator, put a variable supply on it and turn it up and down and change the numbers until the mixtures are the same because, you know, that's, if you had to do that for each of these variables, it's just going to take forever. Um, and another thing is that um, if you imagine at idle, you might be firing the injector for, say, two milliseconds. Um, one millisecond of that might be the time that it actually takes the injector to open. And then you've got one millisecond of actual fuel flow. So if you add 20% to that, it's like you want a 20% fuel trim for whatever reason, adding 20% to two milliseconds is 2.4. You've still got your one millisecond of open time, well, time to open, then you've got 1.4 milliseconds of actual fuel flow. So you've actually um, given a 40% increase in fuel mixture instead of 20%. And you could say to that, well, yeah, but that just means that you need to take that one millisecond out of your fuel map and put it into the battery voltage table instead. Um, and that's true. Um, the question is how, how, as a tuner, do you actually know that that's what you need to do? There are various ways to work it out. Um, various injector manufacturers provide this data as well, although to some extent it does vary on the injector driver circuit in the ECU. Um, we do a lot of measurement of this, so, so we know what it is on injectors that we measured. Um, and then you've got additional temperature compensation tables as well. Um, and if you're doing a, a flex fuel chain, you're changing your fuel chemistry, then you have extra compensation for that as well. Um, and so, yeah, one more, Sean. So um, what it ends up with is you might have eight or something different correction tables which all interact with each other. Um, and if the mixture is wrong under some condition, then you don't always know which map needs to be adjusted. Um, and at some point, you have to look at it and say, well, maybe the model's actually not a very good model. Maybe our initial assumption of um, if we have RPM on this axis and load on this axis and we put the milliseconds in the table, maybe that's not a very, you know, maybe that's not accurate enough representing what, what actually goes on the engine. Um, so instead, we're going to wait. May I come on, I'll start again. We're going to make up another model now using high school maths and chemistry. And all right, so what we want to work out is how much fuel do we need to inject? That's really the ECU's job. Um, so we can work that out from knowing if we can know how much air is going into the engine and the air fuel ratio that we want to achieve. Make sense? So air fuel ratio, it's it really comes from a, um, well, our target air fuel ratio really comes from a target lambda. If you change the fuel chemistry, generally, your target lambda is still going to be pretty much the same. The air fuel ratio will be different though. Um, so that top equation there is our um, um, expression of the air fuel ratio is mass of air divided by mass of fuel. It's just a definition. And lambda is air fuel ratio divided by the stoichiometric air fuel ratio. Again, that's just a definition. Here we go again. Thanks. So the next equation I'm going to give you is um, called the ideal gas equation. Um, I believe it might also be called Boyle's law. Could be wrong about that. Um, PV equals NRT. Now, um, can, can I get maybe a show of hands of who has seen that equation before, who knows what it is? And 
Okay, all right, that's good. Um, okay, I probably won't go into this in a lot of detail then. Um, a lot of tuners I speak to in Australia aren't familiar with that, so, um, so yes, I'll skip a bit of the talk. Um, so that's just pressure times volume. is number of moles times the um, ideal gas constant, which we don't get to change, that's the universe decides that, um, times the temperature. And these are absolute pressure and absolute temperature. The number of moles we can work out by the mass of air divided by the molecular weight, um, which in the old days would look up molecular weight in the back of our textbooks, but these days we just read it off the internet. Um, so, yes, next one, Sean. Thank you. Um, so we can look up those constants. Um, yep, again. Hold on. Thank you. Um, now, the last one is the volumetric efficiency. Um, well, the volume of the air in the cylinder. This is a bit of a fudge. Um, if you've got a, a cylinder that's one litre big, so you've got an eight cylinder V8, sorry, an eight litre V8, um, you could say that the air, the volume of air, air in that cylinder is always going to be a litre at the end of the induction stroke because if you put in less than a litre, it's going to expand to fill a litre. And if you put in more than a litre, it's going to be squished to, to be a litre. Um, but what we're measuring though is the pressure in the inlet manifold rather than in the cylinder. So um, this, um, that Greek N symbol there is what engineers use for efficiency. And this is an expression of the volumetric efficiency. So if you've got um, um, an eight litre engine, we'll say, to make the maths easier, a one litre engine, and through um, a complete cycle it only draws through 0.8 of a litre worth of air, then you'd say that it's got 80% volumetric efficiency. So we can consider the volume of air that gets sucked out of the um, intake manifold being volumetric efficiency times the cylinder volume. So this is for each cylinder, we just doing one in isolation. Um, so now I've got five equations and that describes everything that happens. And we can put those all together and rearrange them into a nice equation that, you know, if someone wanted to, they could put on a t-shirt. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the algebra here. It's actually pretty um, straightforward. You can do it yourselves if you want to. Um, yeah, another one, Sean. Rearrange that. And then we end up with And then, yeah, there you go. And that's basically the equation on the t-shirt. Um, if you go for another one, another frame, thank you, you'll see that. Um, so fuel mass is that one. Manifold pressure is our P there. Volumetric efficiency is there. Cylinder volume is there. That is put up there with a divide by sign in it. But when you work that out, it ends up to be in SI units, it's actually 287, but if you're doing it for fuel mass in grams, then it's 0.287. Um, yeah, air temp, lambda, stoichiometric AFR. So, um, now everyone should understand that T-shirt if you didn't already. Um, and there are some, uh, if you go forward again, thanks. Um, I think we all understand these variables anyway. I probably don't need to go into those. Yeah, happy? Yep, cool, okay. Um, so the next thing I'm gonna go into is some implications of this formula. And the reason I'm doing this is it, it may seem obvious now that we've gone through that derivation, um, but people ask me, so um, here's the answer. Um, people ask, for example, if you've got the same um, VE in the fuel map and your manifold pressure increases, so boost increases, um, then does the ECU inject more fuel? And we know the answer to that because P is on the top of the equation there, so the answer is yes, it does. It's just more fuel. If you charge the tank target lambda or target AFR in the table, will the ECU automatically um, change the amount of fuel that gets delivered? And the answer again, yes, because that's part of that equation. It also, if your stoichiometric AFR is calculated from what we read from a flex fuel sensor, it means that in theory you don't actually need any um, correction for for ethanol concentration, at least for fuel, um, because you know it comes out in the in the formula, and in fact that's what you find. Um, yeah, one of our customers just did one, and the um, he tuned it on gasoline, and then put in E85, um, and with no corrections at all in the fuel map, um, he was within two percent of the lambda that he was before. So that was 
you know, reassurance that this mathematics does actually work. Okay, can you go for it? Thanks. So um, everything I said before assumes a steady state condition. Um, but we've all driven cars with no transient correction set up and um, they really don't drive very well. Um, so what we're going to go through is why this is, the physics of what actually happens in the engine, um, and then what to do about it. Um, so in some ECUs I've actually seen you know, about eight different tables with additional milliseconds and decay rates and that sort of thing. Um, and they all suffer from the same problems as the millisecond based fuel maps, which is that you know, if you change to ethanol instead of gasoline, then suddenly your extra milliseconds need to be bigger just because of the different fuel chemistry. Um, and if you, uh, if you change injectors, then obviously all those numbers go out the window as well. So what we're trying to do is, is work out how do we avoid retuning all those maps for, for every car that we do. Um, so there are three problems that um, I've identified anyway, maybe other people have other experiences. Um, that, that require transient throttle corrections. The first one is that um, the map sensor actually doesn't give you um, a good enough signal, first of all. So I'll try and draw this. If you look at manifold pressure as the engine rotates, like I'll call that 0, 360, 720, this is crank angle, right, as the engine rotates. Make it a four cylinder to make it easy. Um, if you look at the map, it actually has a hump like that because as each cylinder does its intake stroke, um, it you know, sucks out a bit of manifold pressure and the pressure goes down and then you know, it gets charged back up through the throttle body. So that, that's at idle. Um, and what that means is that you can't just look at the instantaneous map value to calculate the, the fuel quantity because um, it gets really noisy when you do that and the, the mixture is not very stable. Um, now, if you filter it, and there are a couple of ways of doing filtering, by the way. You can either look over a, um, a window, like you can look every 180 degrees and take the average, or you can do a time-based filter, and, and we actually do both. Um, but the downside with that is that um, whatever you do to filter it is going to slow down the response. Um, and that means that when you, when you snap open the throttle, if you're using manifold pressure as your load um, determinant, um, then you, you don't have the right amount of fuel anymore because you're not calculating the right amount of air. So that's one problem. Um, the other problem is that uh, when you fire an injector, not all the fuel goes, well, on a port injected engine anyway, not all the fuel goes directly into the cylinder. Some of it falls into a, a puddle, which we call the fuel film, um, and doesn't go straight into the engine. Now, some people would say that fuel gets wasted, but it doesn't actually get wasted. It's not like it builds up there forever. Um, it evaporates over time, gets sucked into the engine. And when, when I say evaporates over time, that time constant is, it's fairly long in, in engine terms. It's um, various engines I've looked at have been about 0.2 to 0.4 of a second. Um, and that means that if you, um, if you don't compensate for that, then um, you're going to end up with a lean period in, until that all um, reaches a steady state. Um, and the last problem is that if you do the injection before the intake valve opens, like a lot of factory cars do, then if you open the throttle while that cylinder is doing its intake stroke straight afterwards, then it can have injected the, the correct amount of fuel for the air that went in before you open the throttle, but then now you've got more air going in, so you actually need to chase that down with more fuel. Okay, so the way that... Um, uh, what I said before about the map filtering, you know, slowing down things and making it too slow. Um, if you can imagine an engine at idle, so um, if the manifold pressure is there at say 30 kPa absolute, which is about 20 inches of vacuum. Um, if you then snap open the throttle then, and the actual manifold pressure goes up really quickly because at, um, if the pressure ratio is greater than two to one, then the air actually goes through the speed of sound, through the, well, at the speed of sound through the throttle body. So the throttle body fills up very quickly to you know, zero inches of vacuum or 100 kPa. 
Um, but if we've got a filter, it's going to the manifold pressure that we read at the ECU is going to be slower to respond. So um, if you wanted to actually trim that with a, um, a percentage fuel enrichment, you'd actually need to give that amount of enrichment, like 200% or something, um, to compensate for this problem. And if you've got to trim something by 200%, then it's telling you that the model wasn't actually very accurate in the first place. It's got a light on now, so that's good. Um, so the way, that, uh, the way that we do it is we have what we call a predicted map table, which is um, what you would, um, the manifold pressure that you'd normally expect to see at certain RPM and TPS combinations. Um, and then when the ECU sees a rapid throttle movement, it can look at the greater of either what's measured from the sensor or what's, um, or what's in the table. And that way you get the responsiveness of a, of a throttle position tune while still having the accuracy of a, a map-based tune. Now this fuel film thing is a bit, um, a bit more complex. Um, this is a, um, an algorithm called X-Tau, by the way, which I think was invented by some um, Ford engineers. Um, there's an excellent YouTube video on this called um, if you do a search for transient fueling, um, then that's, that gives a very detailed description of this. Um, so I'm going to give a more abridged description of this now. Um, so when you, if you imagine, say we're going to inject, say, 10 milligrams of fuel, just to pick a number, we'll probably have about 70% of that goes straight into the engine. And 30% of that goes into this puddle, fuel film, on the runner walls and you know all that sort of thing. And that evaporates in time, or well, over time, to go into the engine. So in the steady state, so in the steady state, this is being filled up at the same rate that it's evaporating. So, you, so the amount that you inject here, you end up with here, but it's not actually the same fuel it's, that's coming out of the puddle. So what that means is that if you, um, if you suddenly want to go to, um, yeah, so we call this 30% value here x, and the tau is the um, time constant. So you know, 400 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds, whatever. Um, so to give an example, if, we're going to, if we want to deliver 40 milligrams and, we're only, um, and we don't do any correction for this, then 70% of that is going to go straight to the engine, which is 28 milligrams. 30% of 40 milligrams is 12 milligrams. So that'll, that'll go into the puddle. But the puddle, at this, before this happens, the puddle is a certain size that it was before, um, and that will give us three milligrams of fuel because yeah, that's what we were doing before. So, so the total of that is only 31 milligrams, um, and that's why, that's why it ends up being lean for a little bit if you, if you don't do any correction for this. So if you actually want to deliver 40 milligrams, then we need to work out the size of the puddle and how much fuel is going to be evaporating into the engine, which is, well, we know that it's going to be three milligrams. Um, so we need to deliver another 37 to get our 40 in total. So to get 37, we need it so that 70% of this number is 37. Make sense? So 37 divided by 0.7 is um, 53. So 37 goes into there, um, what's that, 16, goes into the puddle, and 3 comes out of the puddle. Um, now if you were to think of this in the, the old school method of percentage enrichments, then that would be an, an enrichment of 32% to get from 40 up to 53. Now it's not actually an enrichment, you're not actually trying to get a richer mixture, it's actually just 
a, a change that you need to apply to actually get the correct mixture. Um, so this um, automatically works perfectly for the different loads, these different throttle engines, different throttle open rates, going off idle, so by open throttle, so part throttle, part throttle, full throttle, um, different temperatures. Um, um, obviously, because it's ratio metric, everything you know works with different um, engine sizes and injection types and that sort of thing as well. Um, so it's um, yeah, the, the maths of it is, is actually pretty straightforward, but it actually works really well in practice. Um, now, I was watching that whole um, um, YouTube video that I first learned about this, and I was waiting for the punchline, which is how do you find out what X and tau actually are? And I was really disappointed when it got to the end and said you have to determine that very correctly. Um, so <laughs> basically, if the um, uh, if it goes um, too rich, then it means that you've got too much X, and you actually um, actually less fuel is going into the puddle than, than you think it is. So you actually need to apply less correction. Um, if it goes too long, then it means that you need more. Um, if it's right and then it becomes too rich, that means you're doing it for too long, so that the time needs to reduce. And if it's right at first and then it goes lean, that means that the time needs to increase. Um, yeah, the next um, problem is the Gulf of Air problem. So we've already injected the right amount of fuel, but the new amount that you need um, is requested after you've done the injection. So in this case, for example, we've decided that we're going to inject 10 milligrams, and then the throttle opens and it wants 53. Um, so there's a difference there of 43 milligrams that we need to make up. Um, so the way we do that is we look at that difference, and if that's greater than a certain amount, we actually do an asynchronous injection burst um, um, to generate the, the chaser of fuel from that. Um, and again, that being calculated from the, the, the fuel model means that um, it automatically works for different injector types and different structures and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, on some engines they don't need that entire amount, maybe less than that, um, depending on exactly the injection time and that sort of thing. Um, so, we've got now a fuel mass that we're going to try and deliver. Um, so the question is, how does the ECU work out um, what, how many milliseconds that needs to be? Uh, well, the first thing that we need to understand is that the injector is basically a, a volume flow device. Um, some people specify the mass flow, but um, uh, really they, it's their volume that is the more constant variable. So knowing the fuel mass, which is what we need for, to achieve a certain air fuel ratio, um, we need to get the volume for that, which means we need to know the fuel density. Um, so gasoline versus the 85 have different densities and both of them change with temperature and both of them change by different amounts with temperature as well. Um, gasoline temperature coefficient um, changes with different gasoline mixes as well. It's not really, there's no sort of one constant gasoline. Um, but um, again, you, you've got to tune it for something unless you you know, running a controlled race gas or something, then you don't know what it's going to be. Um, but once we've worked out the density, which we know from the fuel type and the temperature, um, we can convert, um, well, we've got a fuel volume now. So now we need to convert that volume into milliseconds. So for that, we need to look at how an injector actually works. So a perfect injector would turn on, so it open instantly with voltage, and then it would flow the constant rate, and then shut it off, it would shut off immediately. Um, so if you were to do that, then if you were to pulse the injector with, um, with different on times and gradually increase that, then the amount of fuel delivered for each pulse would increase and go straight through zero and be a perfect straight line. Um, in practice, that's not what happens because an injector is a magnetic device and it actually relies on generating magnetic field to open the pintle against the fuel pressure. The fuel pressure holds the injector shut. Um, so that means it needs more magnetic force at a high fuel pressure to actually open the injector. Um, the magnetic force depends on the current through the injector. Um, and an injector is an inductor basically, so it, so it doesn't actually develop current immediately when you turn it on. It takes some time to build up the current. 
So the current builds up faster if you've got a higher voltage applied to the injector. Um, and so the, um, the dead time, if you like, the amount of time it takes for the injector to open um, becomes lower with higher voltages and it also becomes higher with higher fuel pressures. And we, we probably all knew that already, but I just thought I'd go with the basics. Um, the other thing that, um, that I would expect people would know that, again, we get asked this question a bit, so I'll go through it. Um, the fuel pressure, when we talk about fuel pressure as far as the injector is concerned, um, what we're really talking about is the differential fuel pressure across the injector. Because on one side, you've got the fuel pressure trying to force fuel through the injector, and on the other side, you've either got boost, which is trying to push it back the other way, reducing the fuel flow, if you like, or if you've got vacuum, it's actually helping suck the fuel through. So it's actually the pressure difference between the, um, the fuel rail and the manifold that, um, that the injector sees. Um, if you've got a fuel pressure sensor, then the ECU can calculate that because it knows manifold pressure. Um, so here's some actual data from a, um, which I've mentioned on a, um, a 2000. So you can see that this is at a constant fuel pressure, but with different voltages. So you can see that with different voltages, the flow rate's the same for each one. I know there's a few wiggles there. I'm putting that down to my equipment. Um, but they're actually quite limited down to you know, very small amounts of fuel um, delivery, which is very nice. Uh, just for fun, um, here's another injector. Um, so this one's a slightly higher flow rate. Uh, it's a low peaks injector. But you can see that down the bottom here, there are um, quite significant um, wiggles. Um, and it's not even that low a, um, uh, a fuel delivery quantity, that, that's about uh, 25 or so microliters, um, which is a lot. I mean, many engines would idle about you know, 10 microliters or so. Um, so um, I guess when choosing injectors, you have to be aware of the limitations of when you have to use them. <coughs> so um, one example I want to give you is that um, if you if the ECU actually uses the measured fuel pressure as, um, as part of the injector model and knows the fuel flow rate and the um, dead times based on fuel pressure and battery voltage, um, then suddenly fuel maps actually start to look like what theoretically they're supposed to look like. You can see that as, um, um, as load increases here, so this is all the boost here, um, the fuel map doesn't actually really change very much, or well, actually at all. Um, on vacuum it does because of the, um, during the overlap period where the, yeah, the exhaust blows back into the intake, um, which obviously depends on the pressure difference again. Um, but yeah, everything just magically works really nicely when you actually have fuel pressure measured and a uh, good fuel model like, like this one. Um, so yes, I'll just um, I'll look a bit of summary now. Um, basically what I wanted to talk about is that the um, Maths and chemistry of this is not actually all that complicated, and we can't do it. Um, having a good film model actually really reduces tuning time and makes the maths look like what they're supposed to look like, and everything just magically works. Um, and also, especially now that sensors are so commonly available, there's really, um, there's really no reason not to use them. Um, also, there's a lot of published injector data out there. Um, sometimes they don't even specify the fuel pressure that they measure at. Um, so, if you see that, then you can you know, point them to the recording of this when it goes online and they can learn about it. Um, and finally, I'm doing um, two more seminars like this one. I'm doing another one tomorrow on closed loop control, PID control, integrated wind up, and that sort of thing. And I'm doing another one on our new ECUs and walk through the software at 3 o'clock, same room tomorrow. Um, yes, okay. Well, this, that was actually fairly quick then. I was expecting some like open up for questions. Maybe I'll, I'll answer what I can. Um, hey, um, so back, to back you up on your, your fuel model for the, for the, uh, you, the X tau is that what is that the right terminology for that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you're uh, you're calculating that puddle as an important step of getting the right fuel mixture into the transit for the transition of the cylinder. Right? What do you do with that? And I think your last your last figure was sixteen. Uh, Milliliters of fuel in the puddle. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, that's um, of how much extra you need to get into the puddle to make the 
response right in the cylinder, right? Yeah, well, that's, um, uh, we end up getting six inches in the pole, but right. that's a consequence of having to put in 53 here instead of 37 goes through to here. So in your next, in your next several revolutions, your fuel model, that 16's got to go somewhere. So are you allowing for that to come back out in, in evaporation and, and leaning the next yeah, few that's, that's cylinder right. fires out because that 16's got to come back out of that? Exactly. So um, if you were to look at, um, I've got a lot of equilibrium states that go into this. This is happening. I think this is a very fast model here. And that, you know, like if you're talking like steady throttle states, you've already hit a point where what's coming in and what's going out are kind of stable. That's right, yeah. Well, I mean, we're talking about constants of like 0.2 a second or so, which is, um, and that's fairly with the volume engine, engine turns. Um, that's a kind of Makes sense, like you know, you've like driven the car with, with no transient correction before, right? Right, sure. You, you, yeah. you know how the one on one hiccup goes well. So, if you, um, if you have some fuel demand, we're at idle and let's say 10, and we need to go up to 40, like that, then the puddle size, I don't know what puddle size needs to be, so that 3 milligrams evaporates within 720 degrees at that, uh, at that engine speed. Right, right. right. Um, so I'm just going to draw it here. So then the, the puddle's going to sort of come up to there, so that um, right amount that, that evaporates. So just take that amount of fuel that we need to deliver. Um, starts off as being 10. Actually, no, that is the second column. The amount of fuel that we need to deliver starts off there, and then that needs to go up to that 53 that we calculated before, and that will reduce and sort of end up at the steady state value. The reason why that's reducing is that the, um, the rate of our increase in the volume of fuel in the puddle right. has, is reducing as well. So, so both of these look like an exponential decay. So, so is, the puddle, is that puddle size constant? Do you find that puddle size is constant with RPM? Or is it always, is it, is it, is it related to the fuel Oh, no, it's still changing, yeah. Yeah, it's right. Like, so it's always, so, so, so you're not having to lean out, you're not having to drop that red line below that line for a bit to come back and come back to it uh, well, in I mean, reality? If you, if you place the total quickly, um, then... No, I mean just to recover from the, from the transient state of smack, of crack and throttle open. No. That doesn't okay. have to come back under that to, no. to dry that puddle out? No. Really? No, because the, it doesn't have to because the, um, the steady state condition is with this puddle bigger because more of that's going to go into there. Does that make right. sense? So like with the puddle, that's, so when we're at 40, we're injecting 40 milligrams, 70% of that is going to go into the engine straight away, so that's 28. Um, and then the other 12 is going to come from the puddle, whereas three was coming from the puddle before. So that puddle, so is, that puddle is staying the same size? No, no, no. no. At, at, that, at that steady state level? Yes, at the steady state, yeah. Right. At constant RPM, right. constant level, we'll stay the same size. Yeah, that's right. Um, this is a variable. In our, um, our software, you can actually see um, all these calculated variables. So the, um, the fuel mass in the puddle that it's calculated, um, the amount that, we, that the engine wants, the amount that we are actually injecting, and so, say, and so when you're empirically getting those numbers, are you just are you just doing that with a no, wide band in that cylinder and trying to allow for the wide band delay time and see? Because yeah. your wide band delay time's got to be a large percentage now of what you're trying to figure out. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. it's um, um yeah, I mean, having um, having wide band data that's fast stuff is um, yeah, it can be can be challenge. Um, with some of them, they, um, they actually output on their display faster than they send out. Right, them. yeah. Um, so, in these sort of situations, normally what I do is I look at the display rather than look at um, I need to experiment a bit more with um, different wide band technologies to find out what you can do this in real time. It'll be a whole other good topic for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll do another talk. Can you speak at all to. Uh why good injector data for one ECU tends to be uh, 
not so good for one with different injector drivers? Um, yeah, I can. I can. Um, it's because um, this, by the way, is in the um, BSAE J, was it 13? 1832, yeah. Um, in that standard, they actually say um, when you're doing this test, you should do it with the injector drive that's going to be used on the car with the injector. So, um, um, so it, it, it's well understood that um, that's going to be different. Um, but if you, if you just imagine a, a saturated injector, so a high pen injector, just to keep it simple, and if you look at the injector voltage, um, we're going to start off at yeah, we're going to supply voltage, like the 14 volts, just for the sake of argument. Now this is called a back EMF spike. Um, when, the, when the injector um, current reduces quickly, it actually generates a negative voltage in the opposite direction. Um, it's the same principle by which you get a, um, a high voltage spike from the emission coil. Um, so that's, that's there to stay. But you can't let that go as high as you like because it'll actually blow up the output transistor in the ECU. So there's a couple, a couple of barriers here. One of them is how close does this get to ground? That's, that's one variable. And the other one is what's our plant voltage here. In practice, it doesn't go up like that. It sort of clamps their life discharges and comes back down. Now, um, if we look at the injector current, the injector current starts at zero. And at that point, it starts to increase. At that point, it drops down to zero very quickly. Now, that rate of decay there is that voltage there um, times a multiplied by or divided by inductance equals over the other two. So, depending on how, if you have a high clamp voltage, that will actually, um, the current will actually drop faster. Um, the current is determines the magnetic force. So that needs to come down below the threshold for the injector to close. So that's the, the difference there with high voltage um, and the difference in the um, saturation voltage that determines you know, how fast the current rises. So pretty much like this, the electrical explanation of why doing the injector data on one ECU it doesn't always carry over to another. Different parts inside the DECUs, different clamp voltages, different voltages to ground, or different how close to ground yeah. means different physical injector behavior. Yeah, that's um, uh, that's been my observation. Um, I can't think of any other variables that would affect it. Um, maybe other people try more, but I know that um, I mean I do publish data, for example, if they um, they measure with no tech um, ECUs. Um, but they do a lot of validation on factory ECUs, for example, as well, and um, they will match. So I don't know if there's um, if those if those drivers must be very similar. I see. Um, yeah, I I haven't pulled apart enough other people's ECUs to talk about that. <laughs> it's not really what I do. Do you find that the injectors open slower and slower and slower with higher fuel pressure? Yeah. 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 So do you have well, to allow for that them. on you know boost table? At, no, you know, the injector sees a differential pressure. Right, okay. So it would open faster under boost? No, it opens the same speed. So the, um, the, the injector sees you've got the pressure in the rail and you've got the pressure in the intake fold. So <coughs> that way, uh, drawing skills. Um, so you've got, say, let's say at, um, at, at mode, pressure rates on the beast. Let's say we've got three bar in the rail. We've got zero in the manifold gauge pressure. Um, then we've got three bar um, differential pressure across the injector. Um, now, the fuel pressure actually holds the injector shut. Right. But if you were to try and feed fuel into this side, it would try and force it open. Mm -hmm. okay. it, like, you turn the injector around. So, um, if you if we increase the boost to say two bar, and we have five bar fuel pressure, because we've got an unfold reference regulator. Yes. 
Um, my experience is that a lot of times the, you know, if you're going up 28 psi in the manifold, you're not going up 28 psi in fuel. Uh -huh. um, I've, I've seen that. I mean, it's topping out like at, I don't know, 12, 14, 15 psi different. You know, so the difference control does change, and so now all of a sudden your your map has to start reflecting that. Right. But I didn't That's think like about that your differential fuel pressure is actually going off. Yeah. Because, yeah. yeah. So um, that's um, yeah. If you but I never thought about the injector time on that, or, or how hard it is to open. I've never thought about the injector uh, opening time yeah. effect that has, but that's got to have some. Yeah, some in fact, so it'll open faster if there's a lot of differential pressure, but it'll actually flow at a, a slower rate because of this pressure push out. So, um, so the overall milliseconds will increase. Right, yeah. Because, um, because the overall flow rate will have a bigger effect than the change in dead time. Um, but yeah, if you if you put if you put that time into this, so that's another one of your assumptions. Is that is that relative pressure constant? Yeah. Or or uh, a you know that's sort of relative. Yeah, um, it, it, it doesn't have to be now. It's, right. It's, it's sort of one of the points I'm not talking about. Put the sensor on the EC, put the injector data in, and that it automatically compensates for it. And you don't need to put big numbers in the fuel map at high boost, um, because um, but, well, it's not normally what happens in the engine. Okay. Do you know? And just works great. Um, Bradley, um, by the way, with the camera, um, doesn't. Um, yeah, he, he's a, a tuner from back home in Australia, um, and he was tuning a car which had I think it was 3.8 bar differential pressure. At, um, oh, went it was. 3.2. On. I had 420 kPa, and well, at very weak fuel system, by 6,000 rpm, that had dropped by the tune of about 110 kPa, so we went from 420 to 310. And um, the VE table's just flat because in the fuel model that we're using with the electronic ECUs, our fuel injector um, pulse width changes with fuel differential pressure. So, and um, if I was to tune that, assuming flat 400 kPa, my VE table would definitely ta yeah. tail yeah, high with RPM, well, with injector demand, yeah. That's why you're seeing that difference. Yeah, yeah. Also, I'll agree with that. Um, but also, it's also the, for that. Sorry? I said, that's the reason you're seeing the differential pressure change if you don't have enough fuel pumping. Yeah, exactly. Or yep. your filter's clogged, or, or there's another problem. But it can also be a crappy fuel pressure rate. Exactly. Because um, they, none of them is flat. Yeah. They all they all got to select them, and um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. It's a it's a problem with your system. System. Yeah, exactly. So this may be pushing it a little bit on the fuel pressure dropping off discussion. Um, admit my experience on uh, cars that don't have rail sensors or fuel pressure sensors, the injector farthest, or, uh, the injector and the cylinder farthest away from the feed are traditionally the ones that eat shit when um, the fuel pressure the, can't keep up. Um, I mean, do you compensate? across the board on the Autronic fuel model, or are you doing per injector stuff? No, I mean, um, are you getting fancy with it, or, or what? I'm not getting that fancy um, okay. with measuring the, the pressure at each injector. Um, for the simple reason that, again, that's showing a real deficiency in the fuel system. Um, and how to actually model that, I guess you have to run a sensor next to each injector, um, and then model each one you usually. I guess could do. We haven't done it though. Um, I think the money you'd spent doing that would be better spent on fixing the fuel system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Yeah. 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 But even on a good, even on a great, healthy fuel system, there's a lot of pressure. There's pressure drop down that rail. Mm. Regardless, you know. Not if your fuel system's not with a big enough fuel log. I mean, that's mm. there's there's you know, bigger, bigger rails that they have yeah. like a plenum. Yeah. yeah. Well, the other thing is that people are. Um, and we've been, you know, feed them from both ends and that yeah, sort of exactly. thing too. But, yeah. but still, there's still got to be a difference. I don't know how significant. Do you think there would be a flow difference? But 
But when you start micromanaging puddle size, I would think maybe that flow difference is of the caliber of the puddle size difference, for example, between injectors. Ah, uh, but do, do the pressure drop over the top of that, you know, it's a square yeah, hole and all that stuff, you know, so. It's curious, it's direct. Kind of it, sorry. How does the fuel pressure affect particle size and, and atomization? I what haven't measured that, I can't comment on that, I'm sorry. I'm sorry? I haven't measured that, I, 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 okay. I that's going to my, um, Generally injector specific, too. I mean, they'll work to a point, and then you push them beyond that point, and the spray pattern goes to hell. You don't give them enough pressure, and you get big blobs and poor atomization. You give them too much, and they struggle just as badly. They typically have a sweet spot where they're happiest. It's very much per injector specific, or at least injector family. Yeah, the older ones are definitely not very bad about them. Pressure. It's the newer PV14 style wash or PV86 stuff. I mean, you look at ball and seed versus pentel versus, you know, the physical construction of the injector has a huge amount to do with that. Okay. All right. Well, um, I think I'll say thank you very much. I hope it was useful for you.